Welcome everybody. This is the results and implementation workshop for the Rising Waters Year One projects on the nexus of water quality and homelessness. My name is Carrie Winninger with Sonoma State University's Center for Environmental Inquiry, and I'll be your tech support today. So if you have any at any time you have any problems, you can send me a private chat message. So the agenda for today includes a short introduction by the Center for Environmental Inquiries team, followed by a 15 minute presentation by each of the faculty research leads. We'll then move into breakout rooms led by the committee members to give feedback and talk about next steps. And that'll be about 20 to 25 minutes. Then we'll come back to report out, have a quick wrap up. So here are some technical guidelines for the workshop. This is a Zoom meeting, not a webinar, and as such, you all have control over your own video and audio, so please do keep yourself muted except in the breakout rooms for background noise, but use the chat as much as you'd like for questions, comments, and technical help. The event is being recorded, but nothing after the presentation portion will be shared outside the group, so we really hope that you'll all be able to freely share your thoughts today. When you go into the breakout rooms, I'm going to set a timer for them to automatically close. And two minutes before the end of that, you'll see a countdown timer start. So be sure to start wrapping up when you see that timer. Uh, steering committee members, please remember to manually record your breakout session and save the chat file when you see that time counting down. Again, those are just being saved for our reference and for next steps, and they won't be shared publicly. If you all could please take a moment to type your full name and affiliation into the chat right now. This is our sign in sheet for the day and we would really appreciate having that information. Uh, the chat window is also how you can ask questions and make comments during the presentations. With that, I will turn it over to the director of the Center for Environmental Inquiry, Claudia Luke. Hello, everyone. Um, before we begin this workshop and we get into the nuts and bolts, I'd like to provide a little bit of context just for what the Rising Initiative, Rising Waters Initiative is all about. So now and in the coming decades, we are facing these unprecedentedly complex challenges that are caused by a changing climate and are also this long-term habit we have of resource depletion. So with this new playing field that's coming up, we need to get really good at developing innovative, sustainable, and resilient solutions. And university partnerships have a unique role to play in helping with that process. So they bring academic resources, and by that I mean like professors and students and laboratories and research libraries and curriculum. They bring those resources to work directly with community leaders on new emerging challenges. And the outcomes of those kinds of academic community collaborations are things like new ideas, innovative approaches, um, but also can be cross-sector collaborations because when you have a complex problem, you have to address it in a holistic way, that a way that spans all aspects of society. And the third thing that you get out of it is a trained workforce. So the people who are grad, who are studying the problems and graduating from the university are entering the workforce with professional skills and experience in dealing with very complex challenges. So um, Sonoma State um, is very interested in building uh, momentum around these kinds of collaborations. So in 2007, Sonoma State established the Center for Environmental Inquiry to start engaging faculty and students in environmental challenges in the region. And then more recently in 2019, President Judy Sakaki signed the President's Climate Leadership Commitment. And what one aspect of that was to commit SSU to work with North Bay communities to catalyze meaningful and lasting change towards sustainability and resilience. So Rising Waters is emerging out of that background and that intent. It's an academic, academic community partnership that's focusing on water related challenges that are emerging in Sonoma County. And the method, the, the, the way that we're going about doing the Rising Waters method was developed through a series of discussions in 2018 and 2019 with Sonoma Water, the Russian River Watershed Association, North Coast Water Quality Control Board, City of Santa Rosa, SSU faculty, and others. So this was a, a, a joint process in figuring out how we could best work together to form this partnership. 
Um, this, this year one, this is year one of the Rising Waters Initiative, and it wouldn't be possible without the participation of cross-sector leaders in health, social services, housing, environmental protection, and also without the funding from Sonoma Water, the Russian River Watershed Association, and our private donor, Alexander Leff, who I believe is also here today. I just wanna mention in wrapping up that this approach is proving so successful that we're now developing a partnership surrounding other environmental challenges. So next year, we're going to be launching Fire Up, which is a similar initiative that's focused on fire challenges. So please let us know at any time if you'd like to participate in that, just put, put a note in the chat saying you're interested in remaining and, and being involved. And with that, what I'd like to do is turn it turn over the, uh, the podium to uh, Chris Hawley, who works at the Center for Environmental Inquiry and is the project lead on uh, the Rising Waters Initiative. And he'll be giving us just a little more background about how Rising Waters works. Chris. Hello. Um, yeah, so I'm the project lead, a kind of a project development person for, for the center. And and my role in this is to kind of act as an interface or a, a go-between for some of these large complex issues and some of the faculty and students uh, to try to help narrow some of the questions down to bite-sized pieces that we can actually address. And I'd like to acknowledge that this has been a long, long process. So this started you know, a few years ago with conversations between Claudia and Andy Rogers from the Russian River Watershed Association and, and Mike Thompson from Sonoma Water. And those discussions went on for about one and a half years. And then we had a year of public workshops where we sought in, input from experts and um, NGOs in the community. And then this past year, the steering committee has graciously donated their time to help us refine questions and to help guide and steer the faculty and students. So this wouldn't be possible without the donation of enormous amounts of time and expertise from the community. Uh, I'm gonna just make a few points before we, we jump into the, the actual presentations. And one is that our, one of our major goals is to not only of course solve complex issues, but to get students involved. And the reason for that is that students, of course, are the next generation. They're gonna to have to help solve these issues, but they're also very enthusiastic and their faces really, really, really light up when they realize that, you know, it doesn't matter what their discipline is, that they can actually help talk to people. They can actually help develop technology. They can actually help propose solutions that maybe we haven't seen. And so their enthusiasm is contagious as well as their frustration um, when they get frustrated at uh, how the real world works, often they have the energy to help us maybe bust through those barriers. And that said, what I'd like to do is maybe uh, set the expectations for having students involved. So, you know, so students and faculty bring research and bring passion to these questions. Um, but it is perhaps a bit unrealistic to expect them to solve in one year what the quote unquote adults in the room have spent, you know, 20 years maybe messing up a little bit. So, so what they bring to the, uh, <laughs> to the equation is enthusiasm and a new set of eyes and a real kick in the pants as to how to look to these various issues. Um, and, and they can spend time looking at these issues in depth. And this is time that the rest of us often don't have. And so that's very valuable when they start interacting with the community and bring back their questions because it really, really can illuminate uh, some of these issues. I just have a couple of more points about the presentations you'll see today. And I think one of the biggest things is I'd like to make a comment about compassion. And I wanna make it very clear that there are issues um, leading to individuals experiencing homelessness. There are issues with individuals experiencing homelessness. There are water quality issues. And we are not 
blaming individuals experiencing homelessness for any of these issues. Uh, we're not blaming anyone in society for any of these issues. Um, we're really just a group of people who cares trying to get together to figure out how best to approach these problems. And so, you know, I'll use myself as an example, you know, because language can get a bit tricky sometimes. Um, so I have asthma. And when we're talking about asthmatic issues, um, I will, instead of saying people experiencing asthma, I'll just shorthand asthmatics, because that's what happens when you're thinking and trying to present complex ideas. And so I just like to remind everyone in here, in spite of language, possible language missteps, to just be gentle with each other, because we're all on the same page. And finally, you know, the question might be, where are the students? I know we have at least one in the audience. And the students were very enthusiastic and, and really went out to the community. And I know I uh, talked to members of the steering committee and got guidance. And they did the bulk of their work during the spring and summer um, because of the way COVID worked out and the restrictions and the challenges of getting something so complex going. So many of them are beginning classes this semester and have other obligations. So if anyone is interested in seeing the student's take on what they've done in the student presentation, we can certainly make that available after this presentation or if you email us. Um, that said, uh, their enthusiasm and their contributions have been quite outstanding, especially in the light of COVID. Um, so those are only the points I wanted to make and I didn't want to steal anybody's thunder. So. With that, I guess I'd like to introduce our first presenter, uh, Dr. David Sewell, who works in political science. And he led a team of students in what we are calling resource mapping, or how we pro better provide services to individuals experiencing homelessness and how we better document the situations of individuals experiencing homelessness. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to David. Hi, everyone. I just want to dive right into the presentation. I know we've got limited time together. Uh, our team focused on GIS mapping of public water services. And we began with the question of what is at the intersection of these three concepts of um, homeless, homelessness, water, and GIS mapping systems. Initially, we were thinking about the, uh, the relationship with, um, with pollutants ending up within local waterways. And as we began to explore this concept and the ways in which GIS mapping might be utilized to, to address that particular concern, um, it quickly became apparent that um, the, the tools and the data that would be produced could be used for other reasons, including things such as clearing homeless encampments and potentially actually endangering the lives of those experiencing homelessness, especially in particular through the use of GIS technology, if we could like pinpoint exactly where it is that these places exist. And so uh, we, we, we began to refocus our, our attention um, because GIS mapping software, like any other tool, begins to influence the conversation. And so initially, this is kind of the way we were thinking about it. You know, where, where, what is at the intersection of these three concepts? But we began to reframe the conversation and think about uh, centering water as a fundamental human right and framing it, framing access to public restrooms as a civil right and therefore mapping access to public water services for those experiencing homelessness, change the conversation to be about the systems rather than about the people experiencing homelessness. And so I actually redrew the image to reflect this idea of the shift 
so that there is great, um, greater attention to the overlap between um, access to water services and the integration of GIS technology tools is just an, an aspect of this conversation. So this is uh, the research team that I led, and um, these are all former students of mine, and uh, they're all part of the MPA program here at Sonoma State. Jamie Thompson is with us uh, today. Uh, just a quick uh, recap of, of the project components. Um, it's very easy to miss, but there was a, an aspect of the project that revolves around the, the training and the use of the the GIS software, which is QGIS. And then there was the gathering of public uh, data. And then there's the mapping of it. And then ultimately, uh, after today, is the use by the, by the Rising Waters Committee and for information and decision making. So just to give you an idea of some of the issues re related to public data and access to it, in particular around issues of uh, access to public water services. So the, at the Sonoma County Regional Parks website, you can go on there, it'll display a Google Maps based display of all of the parks. And there's even a place where you can go and locate what services are available at all of the, each of the different parks. And those can include um, accessible, accessible areas, backpacking, equestrian trails, and so on. But information about publicly available restrooms and water fountains within the parks is actually not available on, the, uh, uh, on that website. I spoke earlier about treating wa water as a fundamental human right. And in fact, in 2010, the UN recognized the, uh, the human right to water and sanitation and described it as the right to safe and clean drinking water as and sanitation as a human right that is essential for the full enjoyment of life and all human rights. And very shortly thereafter, the state of California uh, passed its own uh, Assembly Bill 685, declaring that every person in the, in the state has a right to safe, clean, and affordable water. Within our nation's history within the last um, century and through, through into this century, access to public water um, what was seen as a civil right. And there were various movements, whether it was the civil rights movement, the disability rights movement, or even today for those um, transgender rights. I point out, that this is a conversation that we are very familiar with having with each other. It is part of our history and it is, uh, and it, we, we have a fundamental belief that access to public water services are integral to our, um, to our, to our society. We are used to, having this conversation. We are familiar with this conversation. But when it comes to providing access to public water services for those experiencing homelessness, um, on the research side, it tends to be largely understudied. And even though individuals experiencing homelessness have some of the worst access to water, sanitation and hygiene services. The other thing is that we increasingly are relying on the private sector to provide um, this access. And in fact, many cities and counties and states have criminalized urinating and defecating in public, which puts those experiencing homelessness in a nearly in an impossible situation in which they have no reasonable alternative but to break the law every day. And so we end up criminalizing a natural and necessary bodily function. 
I want to speak briefly about open source GIS software to indicate that it's really a collaboration of software programmers from, from literally throughout the world. And the key element of, of open source software is that it allows for the modification of the actual source code. So you can go in there if you're skilled enough and edit the code and help to generate new versions of the software. Uh, GIS itself is a computer-based system and it's used to create, to manage, to analyze, and to map multiple forms of data. And the particular tool that I selected is QGIS. So QGIS version 3.14, there's a more current version, but that's the one that I used. I also want to point out that through this uh, project, um, I worked with one of the graduate students to provide training in the use of of the QGIS software. Uh, that's an important component, is, and I'll speak about that later. Um, and the training addressed the downloading, the installation, the import of text-based data files, as well as photos into QGIS map layers. And uh, this, this uh, what I'm presenting today is based on publicly available data. Uh, data. There was a data file preparation, and then it gets imported into QGIS to generate the map. Now, just to, just to point out, there are some limitations and delimitations with this study. Um, this is about publicly available geographic data on public restroom and public drinking fountains. So I mentioned that the uh, Sonoma County Parks website uses a Google Maps uh, structure. I'm trying not to rely on those types of commercial applications. Um, I'm trying to utilize publicly available geographic data and that may include such things as street addresses or GIS coordinates, wherever we can locate it. And we didn't focus on uh, rest public or restrooms or drinking fountains without readily obtainable street addresses. The next study will look, actually look at the, the photo feature of the uh, QGIS software. So this was exclusively about uh, those with street addresses. And we, did not and we did not focus on private water services. And those are those owned and maintained by the private sector, like restaurants or coffee shops or, or other stores. So these are public restrooms, public drinking fountains. There were two sources of information obtained from the Homeless Action uh, website, and they publish a, a, um, a roster of public toilet hand washing stations that was current, that is current as of last, um, last April. And I wasn't expecting this, but they also have a list of shower resources, again, current as of last uh, May. The uh, Petaluma Parks and Recreation Department actually does provide a similar map of uh, facilities, and they include uh, public restrooms in their roster. And so that made things easier. And then within the publicly available map, the public, uh, Petaluma Parks and Recreation Facilities are the available restrooms and drinking fountains. In total, there were about 111 different locations that I was able to track down that had these uh, the, the street addresses. So once I had the street addresses, that didn't necessarily mean that we have the GIS coordinates. Fortunately, the, the US Census Bureau provides a, an online tool that allows you to upload a spreadsheet full of addresses and receive back a text file of addresses that contain the GIS coordinates. And it's completely free, anybody can use the service. So let me just kind of quickly recap the process that was followed. So we, so we went out to find the data sources, we obtained public uh, water locations uh, through, the, through the search, located the GIS data using the US Census Bureau website, take all of that information, create a data table, we import it into QGIS and it produces a map. And here's the map and there's the address. I'll, I'll walk you over there shortly. But the, the map is saved locally and uh, the, there's a folder of mapping content that gets uploaded to the live server. It displays the multiple layers, which are the restrooms, the water fountains, and the showers. And let's just go ahead and go over to that. 
map. So I'm going to have to pause. If I can. All right. Oops. So here's the software. It's a. It's a. On the, so there's the three uh, options. This happens to be centered in the in Sebastopol. But if we can back up a little bit, we can see all all of the different locations of the uh, publicly available water services. And um, there's Santa Rosa, of course. And you, if you hover over it, it'll uh, give you information. Uh, eventually, you could add uh, photographs. And then here's what's going on in Petaluma. And then something all the way out in Sonoma. So this, um, this tool allows you to present a wide array of information about each of the locations. So essentially it's a database and you can add photographs, you could add feedback, you could add lots of different uh, pieces of information to any, to all of the, all of the locations. And let me just show you the, um, the feature where you can display just the water fountains, just the restrooms, just the showers and so on. So let me go back to the presentation. Okay. So in terms of the uh, of the project, it was it was very important early on to reframe the conversation so that it wasn't necessarily focused on the actions of any, any one or one group of individuals in the community, but rather it focused the attention on the publicly available water services. Um, it's important to improve access to data as well as data collaboration. Um, if it wasn't that easy to locate this, um, this data. I think one of the things that can come out of this conversation, conversation is establishing metrics for, the, uh, for public water services. In terms of being culturally responsive in, in this project, one thing that kind of just gets um, uh, swooped into the, into the general discussion is um, limited access for um, those who gender identify as, as female and their uh, access to feminine products and services, um, it's not always uh, clear whether those types of, um, uh, whether those are, are, are available within the, within the public restrooms either. Uh, we'd like to incorporate photos. Photos actually eliminate the need for addresses. The photos with the GIS software, with the GIS coordinates embedded into them eliminate the, uh, the, the need for, for the addresses. And then this, I believe, opens up the possibility for lots of different ways to collaborate across, um, across the county, the municipalities, even those, um, you know, I, I refer to them as potential data activists. These would be members of the community who would be uh, able to participate through the uploading of, of, uh, of photographs to document what these um, sites look like. And then finally, I mentioned the training provided to one of the graduate students. This, this graduate student now has developed a research capacity of her own to, to generate these kinds of maps uh, and, and to utilize the software in all kinds of different directions um, because she has now acquired this expertise in the use of the software tool. And these are some of the references. I just want to make sure that they get onto the record.
All right, thank you. Thank you very much, David. We had one person who had a comment. I think we have time to read. Um, so Anne Morkill wrote, during a low CN panel last night, I also learned that access to water and restroom facilities is critical issue for farm workers, another vulnerable and underserved community in Sonoma County. It's unfortunate that we take this basic human right for granted. Yes, and I do wanna point out that, like I said, we're, as a society, we're actually very familiar with having this conversation. We've had this type of a conversation for decades. So it's not something that we need training in. It's not something that's new to us. Like it is a part of our social history together. Um, I have a question. Uh, this is Claudia. Um, you, would, you were talking about, um, you know, right now we're just limited to what is publicly available data on public restrooms. And it sounded like the kind of thing you were talking about in taking a photo that had GPS on it is that you could document a, a, a whole slew of different kinds of uh, available facilities that wouldn't be so limited. And so I just wanted to ask, is there a quick way is, or is there a shared process by which we can collaborate around collecting that new data? So I draw a distinction between the, the photograph and the, and the, um, the data sets, because I, I have to believe that, you know, when the cities and the municipalities, the counties set up the restrooms, set up the drinking fountains, somebody has a, a master roster of where all of these things are located. That is, um, that is one thing. Individuals can go out and document what those things even look like, right? Because on, on one, one list, it would just be a spreadsheet full of addresses, <laughs> whereas the photographs actually can add context to what those things look like. You know, think about it in terms of whether it's a, like a, a Yelp review or, <laughs> or, or something like that, where you get context more context and um, whether you have the addresses or not, it's not relevant. It just, um, it, it will locate, you can locate those on the map. Uh, Carrie, I'm just checking. Do we have time for one more question or should we move on? We are two minutes over our agenda, so it's up to you. Okay, let's move on. I can ask in a breakout room. Um, okay, uh, thank you, David. That was, that was really interesting. And I think it'll be interesting as we expand the system and, and get more historical data on there. I know there's some discussions to be had with the the city officials regarding security and privacy issues. Um, so we'd like to move on uh, to Dr. Amon Galinsky, who works in the School of Business at Sonoma State. And uh, he led or guided two MBA students in actually studying case studies. And so the idea was, what are the barriers and how do we provide water and sanitation services to individuals experiencing homelessness. And they did a fantastic job. Um, ah, both students are here. So Lauren and Itzi are here. And with that, I'll turn it over to Armand and he can sing their praises. Hi, everybody. My name is Armand Galinsky. On December 7, 2020, I received a memo that was sent to all faculty at Sonoma State inviting bids for a grant program to study uh, homelessness and uh, the provision of facilities for persons seeking uh, relief while they were uh, homeless. Uh, I have to say that nobody has ever heard this from me before, but I had some personal experience with homelessness. A close member of my family was homeless for some time when I was a senior in college and I had to go and rescue that person and uh, find that, get them off the streets. So I had, this was a long time ago, but it was 
something that has struck a responsive chord. And so I applied for this because one of the uh, one of the questions was, uh, can there be some kind of of case history or case study done of of how uh, we might be able to respond or or what has been done in response to the pressing need for for the types of facilities that people who are are uh, well nomads, vagabonds, hobos, uh, whatever, uh, are experiencing and the displaced and, and dispossessed. So uh, I had of a uh, capstone course in, in business strategy every spring. And I was blessed by two students who, who vowed they wouldn't be here today. So, but they're here. Thank you for coming, Lauren Itze. Uh, I'm gonna try to parlay what they presented to me uh, in a shortened version to all of you. Because the research question really for us was what are the barriers to, uh, you know, it's one thing to map, and David's team did a fabulous job of mapping what's available. But what are the barriers for providing more availability of, of facilities, sanitation facilities, uh, to pe persons experiencing homelessness? So that was the primary focus of the study was to discover those barriers and then to come up with some potential alternatives for overcoming those barriers. So this is the uh, background. I think you've already kind of heard most of this uh, from Claudia and, and also from Chris, but you know, it's, it was really important for us to focus in on the social, political and legal barriers providing uh, restrooms and sanitation facilities or that are preventing the, you know, the preventing the closure of public restrooms for homeless populations living near riparian areas, particularly those near uh, the rivers, streams, and bodies of water that supply not only drinking water, but also agricultural water and water for, uh, uh, for other uses. Uh, we're in a, um, you know, long-term drought situation. So, you know, water is, a, is, is probably the most pressing commodity uh, that we're going to be facing for, for, the, for quite some time. So what, what the team set out to learn, and I have to take my hats off to, to the, the two MBA students who were doing this, was to first of all describe, uh, describe what is the impact of homelessness within Sonoma County and the ramifications to the local environment, as well as some of what we call in the strategic management uh, business realm, the internal and external factors. Internal can be those uh, re related to, to the stakeholders and the communities, and the external factors have to do with things that people can't control, such as climate events and the num rising or falling numbers of, of the population of persons experiencing homelessness. The second was to evaluate uh, what has already been done. Uh, not, and we focused in on the uh, city of Santa Rosa uh, um, and because to try to cover all of Sonoma County was, was going to be prohibitively difficult. And I think that uh, to attend the meetings of all the municipalities and communities uh, would have been uh, too onerous for the students. So uh, they focused in on the city of Santa Rosa. And then they were asked to generate some realistic solutions because it's not enough just to evaluate. I mean, we want our students to come out with, with solutions. They may, some of them may be off the wall and some of them may be written on the wall, but we wanted to know, you know, kind of what are the, what are the ways that we could do a cost benefit analysis to prioritize the effectiveness of, of future placements of, of sanitary facilities and uh, whether or not those, those facilities needed to be on a permanent basis or, or on a seasonal or uh, intermittent basis. And finally, from among those choices to recommend, and it's not enough you know, for our students to just come up with options and the pros and cons, they have to come up with a solution. Uh, so this is kind of what the uh, scope of the work was all about. Uh, they you know, were writing a case that, was, uh, that had various target audiences and among those target audiences had to do with you know, other persons who might be taking public policy courses and strategy courses. And of course, the various publics uh, like yourselves who work in government nonprofits or who are just interested. 
And the primary research, I'm not going to read all the names, but, you know, a shout out and a thank you to all of the people who assisted the students, uh, because they, they came into this project um, pretty much a tabula rasa or a blank slate. So they, they learned a lot from, from all the people who, who provided time and information to them along the way. Uh, most notably uh, community people, but also another professor at another university, a sister campus in Fullerton. Uh, they also did some desk-based research, thanks to uh, our uh, Sonoma State Library, uh, as well as attending uh, various council meetings and so forth. Um, so it was not just a, you know, go talk to people project, it was also a desk-based research project. So the, the, the first question, you know, was, was to think about what, what is the mission of, you know, what, what, what's driving all of this and, and, and how are we going to address, um, you know, putting together a strategic plan for upholding that mission. Uh, I know in some places around the world, mission is considered a very American uh, concept or it's considered, a, you know, a very... Uh, unsavory concept when you think about missions and missionaries. But when we talk about mission, we're talking about what is the purpose of all of this? And, uh, and how are we going to create that sense of purpose? The uh, real is issue I think here is that uh, Sonoma County is not alone and there are ongoing challenges involved in providing any kind of facilities for homelessness for people experiencing homelessness, primarily because uh, there, there's also this not in my backyard mentality of, well, if we provide these facilities then everybody's gonna come, you know, if we build it, they will come. And do we want homeless uh, persons experiencing homelessness to come to our community? So there's, there's also the uh, you know, unintended consequence of, of providing facilities. But the idea was to at least understand uh, I think, uh, what, what are the, the, the strategies that might influence a local leadership or a local community to overcome, you know, those types of not in my backyard or political inertia or even budgetary problems uh, with respect to so solving the, the sanitation problem for, for persons on the street. Students, uh, uh, in a strategic management course, um, you know, this is their GPS system, if you will, is, is to look at the macro environment first. And that macro environment includes the political uh, environment, uh, the environment in which political decisions are made and who makes them, the economic environment, the environment in which uh, any kind of financial or fiscal or budgetary decisions are made and what might be the uh, factors that impact those decisions, whether, and we're talking 2021. So this was you know, a very interesting year with respect to economic forecasts and outlooks and a lot of city and uh, even state government budgets hadn't even been passed yet at the time this research was being done. So it was really difficult to know kind of what the budgetary uh, capability would be for this type of a project. What are the social impacts and, and the demographic changes that are driving not only the, uh, the need, but also the potential solution? Technology is always a, a macroeconomic force, and uh, it, there is a great deal of advancement in a lot of other fields. Uh, there is some advancement now in the field of sanitation and portable sanitation facilities, uh, there's also a tremendous advance, as you saw in the previous presentation, in uh, ways of not only procuring, but also presenting uh, data. Uh, environmental challenges, uh, obviously, uh, <laughs> we're living through an through, through a unprecedented period uh, right now of environmental challenges. And uh, Mother Nature, as we all know, she always bats last. Uh, and uh, right now, um, it's, you know, it's not looking uh, really promising for, for water quality, water, even water ability, uh, not to mention all the other factors that are, that are impacting uh, people in our communities. These are what we call uh, 
events that are that are societal shocks. I mean, we are living through at least since 2000. 15, 16, we've been living through a series of societal shocks here in Northern California that nobody could have predicted and, and very little can be done to, to prepare for that. And then finally, legal uh, is important, legal and regulatory. Uh, there are some precedents that, that the students looked at, uh, particularly in Boise, Idaho. But the idea is to uh, understand, you know, what are some of the legal uh, limitations as well as uh, the legal permissions that are going to be required for uh, providing these facilities. Armand, just quickly, you have five minutes. Yes, I know. So just moving right along, I'm just going to show you that this this graphic shows you the uh, the comparison of homelessness uh, populations across various counties in our in our area, and uh, just to show you that Sonoma County is not alone, but uh, there's been a slight shrinkage. In the, in the population in 2020. Uh, although those, those numbers are all, um, you know, before the official census came out. So there are a number of strategies that, that can be addressed. Uh, certainly a, a strategic plan needs to be, needs to be made to, to understand, uh, you know, how this, how this problem is gonna be solved. Uh, there needs to be a, a positioning with local partners um, to make that plan implementable and also to pilot those temporary implementations and see how well they work. Uh, and I'm gonna show you some examples. And then finally, to try to uh, ameliorate or alleviate public concern about the provision of services. So there are a number of types of strategies, and this is the part I think you'll find really interesting. Of course, do nothing is always, is always an opportunity uh, or some I might say a problem. Uh, but uh, the, the four major strategies would be to provide portable toilets, shower or restroom trailers, uh, Portland loos, and uh, expand the hours and upgrade existing facilities. Uh, that's always a, uh, a political hot potato right there. So they looked at the cost and benefit of those various uh, options and the pros and cons of those various options uh, in terms of you know, whether or not they would be uh, advantageous or disadvantageous. And I can share this presentation with you uh, if you wanna read it in more greater detail. So there are a number of alternatives that might be considered that weren't even mentioned. And you know, maybe these are the, the next steps is to think about uh, electronic toilets, uh, composting toilets, uh, or even building a permanent installation uh, that would be um, available, uh, similar to public park facilities, but uh, less, you know, but of course they're gonna be more expensive than the Portland Loo. A lot of questions still left to address, you know, what about the other problems and other provision of services to persons experiencing homelessness, such as housing. What about the pandemic? Is that going to you know, persist? And we don't know how long that's going to continue. And, and do we want to have these types of facilities open during a pandemic uh, or while we're trying to mitigate the uh, spread of a pandemic or the next pandemic? Uh, we did not conduct any field interviews with actual people who are experiencing homelessness and their perspective might be very interesting to have um, if they are if they care to share that. Uh, the quality data on water are limited. Uh, much of it is old, what we have, and we need to know more uh, to identify specific locations for new public restroom facilities. And of course, quantifying the uh, multiplier effects or the multiplier costs of, uh, of not having these facilities versus having these facilities is really difficult to do. And, and uh, you know, there's always an avoided cost issue associated with, uh, with putting in sanitation facilities, but we're no, nowhere close to understanding what those avoided costs are. So there are gonna be some meetings coming up, uh, but uh, there's still fragmentation of, of, of effort. The uh, management shared similar challenges and need for leadership on this problem. 
And there is some commitment to developing a strategic plan. We don't know where that is right now. This, this was back in May when we concluded most of our research. But uh, the students uh, did point out that the board ought to outline Sonoma County's available resources and goals and uh, you know, give people a chance who are decision makers to, to make an a educated and collaborative decision. So uh, if there are any questions, uh, I'm willing to take a couple of questions. Uh, it depends on time. I know Carrie said I've run out of time, so we'll just have to see. We can take one question if anybody has one. We have a couple things going on in the chat. Uh, the do nothing alternative, while comforting to most people, can really be uneconomical, especially when compared to the alternatives. Yes, a comment, not a question. <laughs> yeah, this, that's an observation, not a question. <laughs> yeah, well, do nothing is always popular for, for those who uh, prefer inertia but to action. But, uh, you know, sometimes um, do something but do less is, you know, the incremental approach rather than a radical approach uh, is, is more logical and uh, more feasible than trying to do it uh, and across the board, let's make one, you know, one solution fit all. I, I have a question. Um, did, uh, did you or your students find any um, public resistance to making public bathrooms uh, available? I don't know if Itzy and uh, and uh, Lauren are still on, uh, but maybe you could speak to that. Um, yeah, I can comment. Sorry if you hear my little ones on the floor here next to me. Um, uh, we did find that there was a lot of public resistance around um, providing like porta potties, especially, uh, people find them unsightly and unclean and didn't want them. This is the not in my backyard problem that Armand was mentioning. Um, a lot of folks don't want them near where they reside or near their businesses. Um, and similarly, um, the, the persistent myth that the restroom facilities of any type would attract um, a homeless individuals to the area. Um, and we found out through our research that that's generally not true that most of the people experiencing homelessness within Sonoma County are from Sonoma County and have lived here for decades. Um, and that providing these services is more of a human right and a comfort than would be, you know, something for them to, to scoff at. Um, and then I, I think other that other than the resistance of just not wanting it in their backyard, there's a lot of resistance around uh, allocation of funding and just deciding what goes where and how much it should cost. I think we saw that with the Portland Lou. Um, there's been just a lot of articles highlighting, you know, how expensive it really was to implement that unit. Um, but now that it's open, we'll actually get to see how successful and uh, beneficial that that unit is. Yeah, and I might add that there are, you know, legal and regulatory barriers such as zoning restrictions, uh, as well as uh, as, as well as barriers with respect to, to uh, what can be put, what can be placed in, in parks and, and other areas. Uh, so, you know, there's, there is a legal opposition that has to be overcome too. Thank you. Are there any okay. other questions? Well, I got to go. No offense. We have to appreciate it, Armand. And I appreciate Itzy and Lauren's hard work. I know Sean had nothing but uh, praise for them when, when he was talking about working with them. So all of you really put in quite a bit of work on this, and it's a hard issue. Um, so yeah, we'll move on to, uh, <laughs> that was funny. Uh, so we'll move on. Uh, to team three and team three was led by Professor Megan Burke, who's a professor of philosophy. And 
her team had perhaps the most general and diffuse question, which was how do we make a knowledge map? How do we figure out who's doing what and present it in a way that makes sense? And they did a great job, especially during the time of COVID. And I'd like to emphasize that the, the team she was leading were all freshman philosophy students. And with that, um, I will turn it over to Megan. Um, thank you for uh, the informative presentations from the other team. Uh, my team, team three, was tasked uh, with, as we dubbed ourselves, aligning the universe. I had uh, three philosophy students, all of whom were undergrads, um, all two of whom were first year students, one of whom was a graduating senior. So I just want to kind of reiterate that we are talking about um, two students who were just right out of high school in their first year of college who had never been on Sonoma State campus uh, doing some really interesting and, and important research. Um, and I hope that I can do justice in sharing some of their outcomes um, with you all. Our initial research question um, was, how can we better align the universe of investments, commitments, and resources being applied across sectors to address the nexus of water quality and homelessness? Um, because it's such a heavy research question, here we go. We operationalized um, this research question to, as you'll see on the right hand side, how can we better align community resources that currently exist that would be within Sonoma County to address both water quality and homelessness. Um, so the initial task was to take inventory of various stakeholders across Sonoma County as, as part of this effort of aligning and identifying what existing resources there are. The idea behind doing so is that alignment, namely identifying who exists, what does what, who does what, where, and for whom might help yield um, a better use of existing resources. However, my students in the process of learning about the realities of homelessness, um, including what it is like to experience homelessness, um, started to raise other questions, namely questions related to ethics, um, and came up with, an, with a secondary question that we pursued in different ways, namely what values are needed to address this nexus. I'll talk a little bit about why we came to find this values-based question as important, um, but of course, um, thinking as philosophers might about the use of resources, we also know that certain commitments um, and beliefs are central to motivating action. So that's kind of the impetus behind the second question. So we can go to the next slide, that would be great. We stayed focused on the, the first question, however, the, the primary question about identifying what community resources exist and thinking about the question of alignment um, in relationship to the process of knowledge mapping. So we identified over 150 stakeholders relevant to these issues of homelessness and water quality within Sonoma County, though there are undoubtedly more who have commitments related to and resources allocated to either or both of these issues. So we barely scratched the surface, um, we believe. Um, one of my students, along with uh, uh, my, my own help in, in her work, uh, spoke with over, around 30, maybe a slightly over 30 um, of those stakeholders directly, and then other research was pursued in identifying them um, by uh, kind of uh, by, by internet, um, mostly in tracking down identifying information and understanding who is who in this capacity. So the function of the knowledge map um, was really to collect data so that we can then map it on um, into some, in some visual, visual capacity. The sake of doing so is to be able to strengthen coordination efforts. Um, as you'll see on the slide, strengthening coordination efforts allows for faster access. It provides um, the improvement for knowledge finding. We found this to be a particular concern 
for organizations who are perhaps new um, to interfacing with either of these issues. So for instance, perhaps uh, smaller organizations that generally historically have dealt with water quality issues now find themselves interfacing with um, and doing work related to homelessness do not, do not have as much knowledge about what resources and what other organizations exist in Sonoma County. So a knowledge map might be very helpful in certain circumstances where stakeholders are perhaps uh, so-called new um, to, to this intersection. However, knowledge maps also very beneficial for the university and community collaboration. So our team really wanted to emphasize and provide resources that would allow Sonoma State um, University in, in various capacities to continue to do work with stakeholders across the county on these issues. But there's also value in, this, in, in the coordination that a knowledge map and such data collection provides. Um, and, and that is uh, basically resource sharing. Um, many of the stakeholders that we uh, talked with identified the need for knowledge distribution. Again, this is very largely coming from smaller organizations um, who are aware that they may lack knowledge about certain issues. It's also related to uses of time. Um, providing access for coordination allows organizations and st other stakeholders to function more efficiently. And then of course, there's the major problem um, of funding. As many of our stakeholders noted, um, restricted and limited and lack of access to funding is a major barrier in aligning, um, in, in aligning the universe or at least providing ways to address and end homelessness and address um, water quality. So a knowledge map may um, provide the opportunity for various stakeholders to be able to work together to um, overcome strict funding barriers. Um, and, and this is in, in many ways a result of the fact that many stakeholders indicated they're often working in silos. So a knowledge map might help overcome the silo issue that is both related to funding, but also just um, a, a result of how it is that, that work um, and efforts are or are not coordinated across the county. So we'll go to the next slide. We also wanted to focus, however, on framing the problem. So on the one hand, the large task of collecting data um, to provide, uh, to create a knowledge map led to lots of questions about how we are to understand the problem um, that does exist. So how we understand and identify the, the problems and the, the barriers to aligning the universe of resources in Sonoma County um, is central to um, how we find solutions. So this led a few of my students down different paths um, in terms of what it is that they were up to. So I'll go on to the next slide. Um, one of my students in particular became very interested in understanding policies and practices that currently are in place to address homelessness and to secure water quality. Um, and this we think is related to the commitment to aligning the universe, because of course we need to understand what is working, what isn't working, what is happening and what isn't happening. So, as my uh, student has identified, people experiencing homelessness are disproportionately at risk uh, for water insecurity, which could include risk of dehydration and heat related illness. As we already have heard, it, um, it includes limited access to adequate sanitation as well as water. And none of these secure the California Assembly Bill or the Universal Declaration of Rights commitment to the human right to water. And we, we kind of want to emphasize that as a human right, this means that it is something that um, we are owed just for merely being alive, not something that one has to earn or pursue um, relative to a certain kind of uh, justified existence. So that leads to a question of, well, how do we do that? How do we create um, structures that uh, secure this uh, human right? And 
as defined by the National Alliance to End Homelessness, permanent supportive housing is an intervention that combines affordable housing assistance with voluntary support services to address the needs of chronically um, of people experiencing chronic homelessness. Uh, permanent supportive housing has also um, been defined in other capacities or venues as comfortable, safe, and affordable housing without time limits. So it might be something like affordable shelter that is also paired with on-site services like job training, education, and healthcare. P permanent supportive housing is a housing first approach, um, which means that there are no barriers to obtaining housing. You don't have to meet any certain criteria um, to, to, to secure housing. And it has been proven as an effective intervention in chronic homelessness. So, Permanent supportive housing as a housing first approach minimizes bar barriers to housing and offers support services that allow people to succeed um, so that they can end their experience of homelessness. There are lots of statistics that show that permanent supportive housing and other uh, housing first measures um, do work. And at the state level in California, there are already several policies and programs that prioritize housing first um, and permanent supportive housing in particular. So for instance, in the 2020-2021 budget proposal, California Governor Gavin Newsom proposed a one-time 750 million deposit into the newly established California Access to Housing Services Funds, which indicates that a primary goal of the fund is to help alleviate street-based homelessness and increase the number of housing units. And then of course, during the pandemic, Governor Newsom implemented Project Room Key as the state's response to homelessness amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, which secured housing first uh, for people um, experiencing homelessness and living without shelter and who were therefore um, more prone to contract COVID. So my, my student became particularly interested in permanent supportive housing as an example of a housing first policy and practice um, because how permanent supportive housing can be understood as integral to solving water quality issues. People experiencing homelessness because they are disproportionately at risk for water, uh, water quality issues or water insecurity will benefit from housing, right? Housing provides a way and implementation um, to secure the human right to water. Um, however, we also find that it's important not to draw a sharp line between programs that end homelessness and ones that manage it. So if you are kind of invested in either the work or in the research, you might know or be familiar with the tension between ending homelessness and managing homelessness. Managing homelessness is trying to take care of realities that exist without kind of implementing measures that will ultimately lead to the, lead to the end of the experience. Um, but we wanna insist that in the meantime, it's important not to draw a sharp line between these two kind of approaches um, because as evidenced by programs implemented during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, it's, uh, it is possible to envision temporary interventions that can secure water quality for people experiencing homelessness. For instance, the Safe Social Distancing Program, the Finley Park in Santa Rosa, um, provided uh, sanitation uh, services to people experiencing homelessness. Um, this was seen as a, a successful measure in many ways. Um, and so my students' recommendation is um, leveraging programs that might in the, in the temporary moment um, secure water quality, but not making those of course, the end goal. Um, those who are already working in the in the county and in various cities um, know there is a difficulty in, in leveraging these both kinds of approaches as a result of funding constraints. This is something we heard many times from different stakeholders, um, though because of the value of the human right to water, um, this is a recommendation or suggestion of one of my students. So I'll go to the next slide. Now we can skip this slide and go to the next one, please. And then the next one. Okay, 
this will be the last thing I talk about. Um, this is what we came to term the invisible stakeholder. And this is to really understand the role of the public, because of course there is a very large stakeholder that we did not get to speak to, and that is the, the general public. The general public should be understood as a stakeholder um, in, and as people um, and as a stakeholder with resources in Sonoma County. So we go to the next slide, please. And although controversial, um, we wanted to focus on the phenomenon of NIMBY or not in my backyard. So I'll say a little bit um, about why in a moment. But it is important to recognize that the general public holds power within various jurisdictions, not only because we are voters in a democracy, um, but as evidenced in public comments at several Ronner Park City Council meetings in February and March 2021, as well as in archive city council meetings across the county, there are many constituents and community members in Sonoma County who are committed to compassionate community-driven approaches to ending homelessness and their involvement in aligning resources is crucial. So we wanna think about how do we motivate the general public to be more committed and more engaged such that community resources are driven to um, projects and policies that end homelessness and secure water quality. One of the barriers, however, to such community-driven engagement on behalf of the general public can be understood in the not, as the not in my backyard phenomenon. NIMBY has been lauded as a problematic term, um, often by those accused of holding or expressing NIMBY beliefs. But we believe that it's morally apt to identify how NIMBYism manifests and what can be done to address it because it is a significant barrier to ending homelessness. So as you'll see on this slide, um, there are some general definitions of what NIMBY is, and then there's some stages that my student identified um, of what of the costs of NIMBYism are. But we wanna focus on what we can do about NIMBY because it is a phenomenon that exists. It is a barrier to action um, and is also a barrier to compassionate community-driven engagement. So I'll go to the next slide. First, we wanna understand the moral problem with NIMBY that it impedes ethical, social action and policy. That NIMBY views are fueled by systemic ignorance. And often this isn't willful ignorance. It's just that there's a lot about homelessness and water insecurity and water quality that people do not know. Um, so just to be clear, this kind of systemic ignorance need not be willful. It might just be part of the social habitus um, beliefs that exist and swirl around around us. However, there are deep consequences to that ignorance, and those are largely misperceptions that can impede ethical social action and policy. So to mitigate NIMBY, um, my students recommended implementing what they're calling political education. So go to the final slide. So political education has been used in various social movements um, to develop civic competency that can influence the general public um, and can motivate political will such that people care about a certain issue. And in this case, the care would be people experiencing homelessness in an ethical and informed manner. Political education, so informing the public um, in deep ways about the realities that do exist and what the problems are can encourage community-oriented action to solve social problems. In a democracy, they may, may also drive constituents to drive resources to where they need to be. The importance of political education and engaging the public as a stakeholder in aligning community resources is because this kind of large-based community-driven action is necessary to change our circumstances. And then finally, the last slide I believe should be our recommendations. Um, we'll go to one more just for sake of time. So obviously, as I've already mentioned, um, our collection of data and initial knowledge mapping suggests that we need to promote more coordination and collaboration, not only among existing stakeholders, but between the university itself and the community at large. Permanent solutions are important, um, but we also need to make sure that we're providing um, access to water quality and water security in the meantime. And then finally, um, there is lots of discussions we could have about funding silos and strict funding requirements that came up in our discussions with stakeholders. 
um, but I want to kind of emphasize the, the public education part here as it became so um, important to my students and it became a, a fundamental concern of theirs that a barrier to um, aligning the community resources that exist um, falls in many ways on the general public, not just on the people who are um, actively trying to um, find ways to work together. So um, there's, uh, if you would like access to our full report, I'm happy to share that in the chat, but that is where I will stop for today. All right, thank you so much, Megan. If we have one very quick question, somebody can go ahead and ask. I see, uh, what is an example of PSH in Sonoma County? Is there a project that is currently underway? Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, Jenna Garcia is probably going to be our expert on permanent supportive housing in Sonoma County. There are um, definitely lots of um, discussions going on around uh, uh, generating public supporting supportive housing uh, programs um, within Sonoma County. Um, so that's definitely a discussion that, that we ran into um, at, at various times, as well as safe parking. Um, so there are lots of things happening in the process. Um, and many of the things that my students and myself sat in on, particularly um, city council meetings, we're largely around um, initiating new policies and new programs um, in relationship to these kinds of practices. Did you want me to give a really short answer? Yeah, that would be great, Jenna. Okay. okay. So yes, there are permanent supportive housing programs in the community. There's not enough. This is definitely the program that's needed the most. There are programs that help people that are uh, a little bit um, higher, lower needs, you know, and maybe just need a little bit of rental assistance, security deposit, some help to get back on their feet. Uh, but permanent supportive housing is exactly what it sounds like. It's permanent and it's, you know, ongoing supports to help folks not just get into housing, but keep the housing subsidy, mental health support, all of that. You know, there's probably close to a thousand, if not more, beds in the county, but once people are in them, they're oftentimes in them for a really long time. Uh, and there's, you know, an ongoing need for a lot more of those. And like Megan mentioned, there's certainly a lot more that are in development or in discussion right now. I won't get into all of those particulars right now, but uh, there is there are some substantial funds, $3.5 billion was made available from the state recently uh, with a pro uh, project called Home Key that is intended to provide mostly permanent supportive housing as quickly as possible, usually through converting existing buildings like hotels. So if anyone's interested in that, I can point them in the direction to learn more, but I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Megan. Thank you, Jenna, appreciate that. Okay, thank you, Megan. I, I really appreciated the discussion of public education as well, uh, especially, you know, I know I've been talking to uh, various government officials and, and folks actually trying to help the issue. And there's a lot of misconceptions among a lot of folks trying to address the issue. So it, it makes it very, very challenging. Um, I think with this, we were going to set up some breakout rooms and the steering committee has graciously agreed to to lead the breakout room. So one steering committee will, person will lead uh, each of the six breakout rooms. And I uh, really appreciate everybody leading the group. Zoom doesn't always go as smoothly as planned. Um, we're probably gonna run about 10 minutes over. I hope that's okay. Uh, this part of the meeting is generally a summary and, and follow on with next steps. Uh, it looks like you know we, we, we've made a good start and we appreciate your feedback. And for questions one, two, and three, you know, we, we have some clear directions forward, I think. I think there's more testing of the mapping application in question one, more use of the mapping application. Uh, question two is interesting, providing sanitation and providing uh, water uh, to individuals experiencing homelessness. I think that there are some efforts going on, particularly in, in Roanoke Park and Santa Rosa 
where it might be interesting to have student teams start to try to walk uh, through some of these solutions with, with officials and, and see if we can actually get some, some additional things installed. Um, question three, clearly there's some follow-ons. Uh, we talked to a subset, you know, 30 to 40 of the 150 to 300 organizations in the county, depending on how you count them. And we did develop a preliminary graphic, rather Megan's team developed a preliminary knowledge map, but we can certainly use some computer science student help in, in making that more uh, in depth. And then the, the, the big issue that is really over underlaying all these issues, whether we're talking to the public or talking to officials is really a public, public outreach component and you know what it's like to be an individual experiencing homelessness, what best practices are. And so there is a, an option to maybe change focus of one of the questions slightly and have it focus simply on public outreach. And I think that's something that the steering committee and, and all of us really should, should think about. So we will be writing up the results of this workshop on uh, the next week or so. If you have comments, please do get them to us within the next week and we'll make it available to everyone. Uh, we have a Rising Waters Year 2 Research Information Session on October 15th at 3 p.m. And this is really to engage next year's faculty and students in the next round of studies for this coming academic year. So I think it's really to build on and expand what we've already been doing. And I think Carrie uh, was gonna paste the year two info session uh, in the chat, there you go. And uh, so anyway, if you're interested in seeing what faculty you know are interested or you have more comments, please do attend the year two info session. And as part of this sort of larger framework we've been working on, we have a North Bay Building Resilience Series. And that's monthly where at Sonoma State, we host a series of uh, lunches basically. Right now they're virtual for stakeholders looking at various issues. So I think the next one is looking at a water resilience and water projects in the county. We have some of them talking about fire within the county. Some of them will be talking about other topics. So if you go and you wanna register for any of those events, uh, you can certainly go to the web page where you registered for this event and you can attend those. So thank you for the steering committee. Uh, we you know, love the fact that you, you helped us and certainly donated a lot of time to work with the students. And are there any you know, final comments uh, from any of the steering committee or from anyone that attended the, the session today? Okay, um, and as a final, just a final thought out there, we really appreciate it. We do appreciate the students uh, putting in the time during COVID, it was particularly challenging. And some of them dealt with anxiety issues, um, meeting people virtually, but they, they soldiered on and their faculty soldiered on. And I just like to remind everyone that if you'd like to partner with us or grow this program, it really takes a lot of brains at the table. So please let us know and we will certainly follow up with all of you about the information session to let you know there's a, another opportunity to reach out to us. So thank you all for being here and we hope you got as much out of it as we did. Thank you, Chris, Claudia, Carrie, putting this on and all the faculty. Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank everyone. You yeah, thank you everyone.